Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm Josh Drive Hayes, and this is part four of my crazy adventure through the Otherland MMO. We finished last episode caught in a crash loop over at Oyster House, and unfortunately the crashes continue, so I began my search for a fix. Before we begin the journey, please consider dropping a like on the video or subscribing to the channel. Ringing the bell means you'll get all the future notifications. And a huge thank you to this vastly increasing list of patrons and my Twitch subs who make my stupid ideas possible. Right, let's begin. I could still log on to my first character, the range class, who couldn't beat the jungle quest, so I could still access the Lambda Mall. And while looking around the internet for a solution to the Oyster House crash, a few friends from Discord hopped onto Otherland, and we attempted to create a clan. Likely the first clan created in quite some time. It was going to be a historic moment. I was filming, we were excited, and then... No, that failed too. Apparently using the clan creation item on another player is just a broken system, so that dream very quickly died. I still needed to fix the crash loop, and I was running out of ideas, and it was thanks to my glorious Discord who discovered... Otherland has its own official Discord, and while there may have been less than 100 people even joined up to it, there were developers of the game active on it. And then I found someone who had the exact same issue that I did, a crash by Oyster House. And thankfully, this absolutely beautiful human being had solved the issue. They turned all the settings to minimum in the main menu and then tried to log back in. So I gave this a go and... Oh yes, we can continue. Part 4 is go. So the adventure resumes. I push on with the quest and oh, it's a small bit of lag, a little stutter. You gonna be okay, game? Oh good, oh it's okay. Phew, had me worried for a second there. I now have to guide Shiloh to the orphanage and this is made difficult by two things. First of all, there's wolves that attack us and make Shiloh run off, but when they are killed we have the second issue, Shiloh's pathfinding. It's less pathfinding and more path guessing. She just runs in sort of the right direction, then pauses and checks, then runs off again. I mean, we do get there eventually, but it's a bit of a trial. Find Fred outside the orphanage and she says the orphan kids seem kind of upset. I mean, yeah, Fred, they're living in an orphanage in a broken simulation ruled over by an insane king. I can see why they are not jumping for joy. Regardless, we have a chat with the orphans and it seems the game has exactly one child model. Every orphan looks exactly like Shiloh. The kids tell me that some strange men appeared one night and took one of the orphans. I have a talk to the patron because while removing kids from an orphanage is ultimately the entire idea, I don't think it's usually done at night in a clandestine way. The patron is just super suspicious. The program keeps fizzling and changing her words, so she is clearly involved. Fred tells us the kidnappers likely arrived by boat because the orphanage is by a river, so we should go and check the shoreline. I mean, yeah, sure, Fred, or they might have arrived by one of the multiple paths that all lead here, but okay, yeah, the river, let's, let's say it's that. Fred happens to have a magical tracking MacGuffin that says there are energy signatures on the other side of the lake, so we swim across, interact with some lovely magical energy, then swim back. The swimming animation is still fine, graphics and ambience are still lovely, the Unreal Engine really can do some awesome things. While swimming, I do take a risk and up the graphics to fair, because I don't want to crash again, but I also don't want the mountains to look like Play-Doh. Fred thinks the patron has been hacked to not remember the events of earlier, and then some shaders attack us, and shaders attacking us will become a very overused trope in only a few short hours. Fred says she can fix the patron, but she needs some Soma. Conveniently, there's Soma growing on the floor right next to us, so I guess I just need to interact with these puzzles 15 times. Eight squared really really is the world of gathering quests. Hand over 15 Soma, fix the patron, and then we're attacked by shaders. Again, okay, I'm gonna keep an ambush counter. That is two. The patron tells us to talk to the kids and see what really happened. This little girl called Rumor says how she tried to look after the other kids while the patron was hacked, but she's not done a very good job and everyone is hungry, but no one can bring themselves to butcher an animal, so asks if we can help. Yes, Rumor, I can. You did your best. This is not your fight anymore, so I will happily help. I need to kill 10 sheep. And while I've never worked as a butcher before, I am certain this is exactly how it's done. A man dressed as an extra from the running man violently hacks at sheep with a giant neon blade until they explode into mutton. 
I also discovered the sheep have a seriously high dodge stat because most of my attacks just miss. I'm back to using the AoE for everything. Now sometimes my special attack manages to glitch the sheep up into the air and not caring much for gravity, they just stay there. And while they are in the air, I spot something. And developers, I have to seriously ask you this. Why? Good God, why? Did you feel the need to model the sheep's genitals? This is a part of the model I can only see because I glitched it up into the air. You would never, ever normally see this. Was this really, really necessary? I butcher 10 sheep, hand it in, and the quest reward is some awesome baggy hammer pants. Yes, no more stupid Tron look. We're MC Hammer now. Next, I need to gather up four lost kids and return them to the village. Where are the lost kids? Maybe far away over a mountain or hidden in a nearby forest? Nope, they are on the path, literally right next to the orphanage. You can see them from the orphanage. So I heroically bring these kids back like 20 feet to safety, and it seems one is still missing, so I go and search for her. She's further away and has been, guess what? Ambushed by shaders! That's three. So we defeat the shaders and then escort her back. Now this kid is unique. While you or I may choose to walk, she chooses to sit down and then casually glide everywhere. And she's not even gliding quickly. And sometimes she'll just glide backwards. She's in no hurry to get anywhere fast, she just enjoys the gliding. With all the kids safe and sound, we get our first shoulder pad armor reward. Oh yes, now we're making progress. You know when the shoulder armor happens, you are in the mid game. We now learn the kids have been taken to the upper bad sector, so I have to daisy chain my way back through some portals to get to the Lambda Mall and then head to upper bad. Once we're back in upper bad, we go to the hacker shop, because whoever took the kids will have left an energy trail and the hackers will be able to help us follow it. I speak to the manager who has the most Karen haircut I have ever seen in a video game. I mean, look at that hair. I'm worried he's about to ask for my manager. The dude says he can indeed help locate the kidnapping, but he is busy with another customer, this lady called shadow proxy over in the corner but if I agree to help her then he will help us I mean yeah sure solving the kidnapping can wait we have time shadow proxy has invented a device that steals you space addresses and wants us to use it to hack into other simuloids house files all this means is get close to a simuloid and interact with them and we'll steal the data all cloak and dagger like nothing violent so we set off to do this and oh look a pub called oh really <laughs> I love this. So our super sneaky mission to covertly steal someone's U-space address is simple. All we need to do is violently kill all of these guards and then interact with this guy who didn't even turn around to see all of his guards being killed. Then we hack more people who also have guards. I'll be honest, game. This feels less like harmless hacking that we were promised and more like actual harmful murder. There is nothing subtle about what you've created. I love how at the end we even break into an actual dojo with enemies training. We have to kill some elite ninja guards and then we just casually stroll up to the guy behind the desk and hack him and he's like, yeah, this is fine. Back at the hacker shop and Mr. Karen has found the kids. Seems they've been taken to an apartment in the upper bad and oh god damn, this plot could go somewhere very dark. Please don't, game. This needs to be a family friendly show. So we run through the streets and we find this green portal to take us to someone's apartment. In we go. And what the hell? The apartment is a jail. There are cages with kids in. There are weapons on the table. This looks very dark, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this. So we talk to the kids and they ask me to find the key and free them. Good idea, I'll get right on that. But then the game manages to return to absurd territory. There are four skulls on this table. And guess what interacting with one of them does? Did you say it massively increases the size of the skull? Because again, you are right, but that was a weird thing to guess. I just don't get this. Who programmed this? Why is this in the game? What purpose? does this serve? Who sat there and thought, I could fix the combat hit detection, or I could stabilise the servers, or I could work on some new NPC models, and then thought, no, I'm going to give the sheep genitals and make those skulls on the table in the kid torture room get bigger when you interact with them. Oh, finally I find the key on the dumb skull table, I free all the kids and then ask them what they want to do. Really, game? I'm the adult. I'm meant to be the hero. I would not ask the kids I have just freed. So, uh, what do you think we should do? I know what we should do. We should get them to safety. The kids do tell me that even more kids have been taken and used in a mining operation 
on Mars. Then Rennie shows up and agrees to take the kids to safety. Now, Rennie, I don't know how you followed me, and I've only spoken to you like twice, but I trust you with these kids' lives, so you take them. With the kids gone, we can explore the apartment, find the weird stash of weapons, and then at the back, a portal that should take us directly to Mars. Oh yes, here we go. And Mars is stunning. Honestly, the Mars level is beautiful. I mean, this is just the opening dock, but it gets so much more impressive. The Martian level is inspired by Arabic, Grecian, and Turkish cultures, and has architecture that feels Moroccan. The market later is very Marrakesh. We start on the docks, and this dude says we can only use the bazaar if we bring him two rubies. I have no idea who you are, but okay, I agree to this. Honestly, Mars is gorgeous. The lens flare, the oranges and golds and deep reds, the textures, everything about this area is just lovely to look at. The god rays filtering down through all the scenery. I spent so much time here just admiring the view. It is such a shame the game takes so long to get you to this bit, because it is great. This dude also has a quest as I walk along. He needs me to find some books for him. Okay, again, no clue who you are, but yes, I am here to help. So where do you think we will find these books? That's right, inside a barrel, then inside a pot, and finally within a pile of CDs. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but the quest design on Mars makes little to no sense. It's like they knew they had to make quests, but they didn't want to make them follow any form of logic. The dude then tells me that I need to meet him in the alley so we can talk further. Okay, sure, but uh, who are you? Why am I helping? Why do we need to meet in an alleyway? So many questions, but all those questions fade away when the light tube appears. Ah, light tube, my old reliable friend. This takes us down to the slums, lots of closed-in houses and tight city streets. Meet the guy and he tells us we need to find his cart in the marketplace, then take from it a pig, a diamond and some food, then hide all those things inside a chest without being spotted by the guards. Again, literally no idea who you are, but I am so on board with this plan. Let's do it. So the Mars is a simulation of a Moroccan style city, except there's a giant mountain towering over everything and it's hollowed out and full of machinery. And they've glued some gears on it and called it steampunk. There's giant pistons pumping away into the mountainside and gears and cogs turning on all the giant turbines. As far as narrative goes, the royal family rules with an iron fist and all the guards are dressed in red British colonial uniforms. The Martian workers are these alien looking things and some of them work with the royal family and some some of them are the rebels and most of them are pretty damn subjugated. After a bit of walking, I find the dude's cart and the game description has wooden crate with omniscient pig. Seriously, every quest on Mars is insane. I gather the bits from the cart and then store them in the chest, which is just right up the steps next to the cart. I've not even gone far. And while I'm doing this, I seem to have activated my first world quest, something I didn't accept but just happened. I need to steal 16 bits of food from the slaves. I mean, no, I don't feel good about that at all. So I check the quest log to see if I've got that wrong and, oh, the uh, description just reads, please change this. Finish up the pig hiding quest and to reward us, the dude gives us a money satchel, which has the item description, a banana a day, keeps doctor away. And this money pouch, described as a banana, is actually one of the two rubies we need to enter the bazaar. See? Mars quests are just off the rails. Follow this dude through the main square and wow. This is the central temple and it is lovely. The reds and oranges of the marketplace fade away to ethereal blues and purples. The ambient music changes to this downbeat side chill. There's even Aurora Borealis at this time of year, at this time of day, on this part of the planet, localised entirely within the main square. The dude tells us the royalty are oppressing the workers and we need to do something about that. He wants us to help sabotage a shipment of rubies that are down at the docks. Now I've learned better than to question this game, so okay, off we go ruby sabotaging. Here's a technical issue, pretty big one actually. 
The Martian slums are very closed in with jagged streets, but they've not optimised the camera for this kind of environment at all. The camera jumps and jerks around the place as you run. If a building is between your character and the camera, then the camera doesn't fade away the building or slowly zoom in. It just instantly snaps close up to you. And we've already seen the problems with looking up and down in the last episode. It makes these streets an absolute visual nightmare to navigate. Meet up with some rebels and escort the group to the ruby ship. You know, when combat works, it's fun. And right now, combat is working. The group fights are pretty decent because your NPC allies are pretty competent and able to hold their own in whatever fight they start. And just as I'm thinking, yeah, this might get better. And just as we've stolen all the rubies off the boat, two things happen. Firstly, this rebel soldier just starts attacking the ocean. And then this enemy soldier just ignores all of my hits, gets bored with me, turns around and walks into a wall, clipping onto the ledge above. Oh, other land, never change. With the boat heist successful, I escort the guys back to the hideout and then get given a second money pouch with banana description that counts as a ruby. My quest list is now empty, so I wander around until I meet a merchant with a mushroom on his head who tells me that he hired a simuloid to advertise his wares down at the docks, but they're not doing a very good job, so we need to go and fire them. You see what I mean when I say that the Mars quests make no narrative sense? Like, how does this advance the story? But fine, I'll do it. As I approach this simuloid, I am ready for a fight because no one likes being told they're fired, but the simuloid takes it remarkably well, saying they don't even need this job anyway. Well, that went well. I let the merchant know it's all sorted, and then he hires me and sends me to the main bazaar on a mission to find some stuff. While I'm playing, I'm also talking to some other players on the Otherland Discord, and apparently some players are trying to come and join me, but they crash whenever they get near me. It might be an item I've got equipped or a skill or something, but even coming near me causes them to crash to desktop. And I'm not gonna lie, that makes me feel pretty damn powerful. As I'm running back to this portal, I bump into a priest. They have a quest for me too, and they want me to talk to the head priest. Now, I don't like having lots of quest lines on the go at once, so I'll accept it, but I'll come back and do this later. For now, we are off to the bazaar. And my goodness, the bazaar is beautiful. The lighting, the sounds, the sights, the people milling around the shops and the carts and the market stalls and the rugs and the barrels and the fabric roofing. It's just a stunningly, overwhelmingly nice area. The quest from the merchant sends me through the bazaar to this box. I interact with the box and a dude appears, then disappears. And then the quest line just ends. Oh, I expected more. Well, I guess we've got the priest line to follow, so I'll head back through the market and to the temple. The temple is in the main square of the docks section. It's the blue ambient place. And up this long staircase and off to the side, I meet the main priest. Not exactly the most priestly place to stand, tucked away on a side ledge, but okay. The priest wants me to deliver some food to a temple island, so sends me back to the bazaar to gather the supplies. While I'm here, I try and do some boundary breaking, but I am constantly worried I'm actually going to succeed and then have to die. Plus, honestly, boundary breaking normally feels like an achievement because the game tries so hard to not let you do it, but in Otherland, it's kind of a simple thing to do. All you have to do is jump between a tent or jump down a mountain or just jump anywhere, really. I've actually put more effort into not falling out of the map. Back in the bazaar and I approach this shopkeeper and sell some of my excess items. I'm not sure if I've actually shared the shop experience with you yet, so this is what it is. You have to left click every item individually, then choose sell, and you get this loud noise every time you click. Just have a listen. Inventory empty, I can explore the market, and it really does feel like a market. Oh, they've got square watermelons! These are real things, you know, they're popular in Japan. They are regular watermelons grown in square moulds because they're easier to stack. They've also got these... square things. And it is now, while exploring the fantastic market, that I noticed perhaps the biggest graphical mistake so far. And I'm glad I did, because this market was making me feel... small, overwhelmed, everything seems big. And then I see why. I angle the camera down low, and without realising, I spot the biggest mistake in the game so far. Absolutely no game asset in the entire zone actually touches the floor. Everything is floating several inches above it. The trees, 
The wooden carts, the market stalls, the tables and chairs, even the NPCs themselves. It's like every single asset was placed on the floor, then raised up. There's a visible gap between the floor and absolutely everything that's meant to be on the floor. These pots, these sacks, these random display items, nothing is lowered correctly. Now, I've never worked in the Unreal Engine, but if you have, tell me, how long would this take to fix? Surely the XYZ coordinate of an item within virtual space is just a slider. You can just slide things closer to the floor. Surely the physical frame that the player is walking on will have an actual coordinate and you could just match up all of the assets with that. If you're familiar with the engine, then let me know in the comments how hard this would be to fix. I find the merchant that has the priest's food, but he won't let me take the food to the island. He wants a favour first. He says some rebels have destroyed some paintings in the royal family's house and I need to go and fix them. I have no idea how this is related to the merchant giving us food for the priests, but this is the quest line, and the game designers believe it is best. The royal family live in the House of Aziz, a massive multi-floor structure that overlooks the market, and there are workhouses and slave quarters flanking either side of it on street level. So getting to the royal family means running through the slums first, which is a very strange layout. I do stop, though, several times along the way to just admire the environments of Mars. The slave house has rows of stable-like housing, and this overlook is a beautiful vista of the market below. And the gear house is full of pipes and metal bars and giant turning gears that power whatever Mars is powered by. Now here I am deep into the back parts of the gear house, a place they probably never expected a player to go, and I find these stairs to nowhere, because they've built them wrong. They have used the archway building wall asset and your character cannot fit underneath. These stairs are pointless. This whole area feels like an MC Escher painting. Eventually, after a serious amount of exploring, I find the Royal Manor. I run up some stairs and it is lavish. Thick carpets, giant windows on one side, a big staircase up both sides of the room, sofas absolutely everywhere, and paintings hanging on every wall. Now, I need to fix the paintings, so I stand in this helix light pattern, which I assume means something, and no, I'm not quite sure what this is telling me. It takes me some time to realise that these swirls of light are indeed telling me where to go, but I have to fix all four in a certain order. You can't just go randomly, because the game doesn't like it when that happens. And just look at this, another technical issue. This is how they've programmed in the damaged painting quest. The real paintings, the clean ones, are flat against the wall. The damaged paintings are exactly the same assets, but also loaded in, layered on top of them. If you angle the camera, you can see both the painting assets stacked together, and interacting with the damaged painting just removes the top layer. Oh, and the damage they talk about? It is literally a solid black spiked shape. And it's the same shape on every single painting. I mean, yeah, it is one way of designing this gameplay mechanic, but it just seems really weird. I fix all the paintings and then return to the merchant. On the way back, I wonder what it would look like if I clipped into one of the rich women NPCs' faces. So I do, and it looks horrifying. I mean, this is not good. Wow. Definitely a thumbnail, though. I wonder if the male faces are any better. Oh my god, no, they are not. Let us never do this again. Return to the merchant, let him know all the paintings are sorted, and he lets us take the supplies, which are, of course, inside a pot. Why wouldn't they be? So then we head back to the priest. Running back through the bazaar, and honestly, the video does not do this justice. So just enjoy the music and ambience for a few seconds, and see if you can understand why I admire this zone so much for its environmental design.
It's immersive. Yes, it has flaws and nothing actually touches the floor, but it's still stunning. Back at the priest and they give us permission to go and visit the Temple Island, so back to the portal we go. The Temple Island is built on the outskirts of the city where Mars is still untamed and barren. And as we journey around, I see a group of soldiers holding off this vicious looking pack of animal things. This area has fantastic music too, it's a mix of Vaporwave and Synthwave, it's very daft punk Tron. Top of the steps, hand over the food to this group of priests and then we are ambushed by Vormags. Ah, that's what those things are called. Also add one to the ambush counter. The priest is thankful we are here and sets us on a quest to light all of the temple beacons, so off we go. I love the fact that I now get to run into the open vast red of Mars. This is so different to the congested city streets and so barren compared to the forest we were so recently in. I'll say it, this might be one of the nicest areas in the game so far, the dusty red ground contrasting so starkly with the beautiful blue night sky. The thin cosmic strands of stars and energy fraying out in the distance, the bright beams of light being shot up into space from the temple around us, the distant clockwork city and the constant machine motion of the mountain below. This is a beautiful use of colour and distance in gaming visual design. Lighting all the beacons means finding them first and this one is up a hill and why? Why is one pillar leg shorter than all the others? What made this happen? Such a unique setting, such a beautiful skybox, such graphical inconsistencies that serve to stand out and be like, hey, hey, look at this short pillar leg here. Look at this stupid short pillar leg. Look at me, not at the sky, look at me. We light the first beacon and then head back to the docks. The next few beacons are all in the slum section and this means more god-awful jerky camera motion. At least the skybox still looks nice. Oh, and there are ships flying about in the air in real time. I'll show you more of those later because they're actual models. Then the ambient music plays a really strange metallic sting. And to me, and I know this is really specific and most of you won't get this reference, but it sounds exactly like the sound effect that plays in the first Matrix movie when Neo touches the liquid mirror and then it reforms and fixes the cracks on itself. Have a listen. See what you think. The next beacon is up on this roof and why have they shrunk this model? Why is the scale so wrong? The steps are tiny compared to me. While I'm running around in the docks, the guards will attack me for like no reason. I'm just minding my own business and suddenly bang, bullet to the face just for being me. Back at the high priest, let them know the food is delivered, the beacons are lit and Gondor calls for aid. She now explains that most of Mars is mapped out, but not all of it. There's a team of very, very British explorers who have returned from a cartography expedition, and I should go and join them and see if I can help in mapping the planet. The explorers are hanging around the bazaar, and my god, are they English. I mean, look at this guy, moustache, a tan shirt, probably loves Yorkshire tea. This is one spiffing Brit. We're sent to the docking platform to meet a returning explorer, and let's just take a moment to appreciate this. The ships you can see docking and leaving in the distance are doing so in real time. That's not a skybox animation, that's a model. And as we run closer, I will wait for one to dock just so we can appreciate the sheer size of it. Running down the docking platform toward the end and I am in awe of how beautiful this part of the game is. We've gone from dystopian sci-fi city to dense natural jungle, then rolling fields and hills of fantasy chess, and now we're in the cosmic glow of a star dock on Mars. Visually, this game is a work of art. It's just so remarkably flawed that very few people will be motivated enough to get to this bit. Remember how only 3% of people have the fourth Steam achievement? Well, the maximum amount of players I could ever find for this game was 200, which means even if those 200 played to the end, only six people have the Steam achievement. I'd compare this game to films that did badly but still offer a visual treat, or bands that never really took off but still have some fantastic hidden songs. This film is strange, it's weird and wonderful, it's impossible to summarise, and it's absolutely got flaws, but it's such a memorable journey, and I really think Otherland, if given a serious fix-up, 
could no doubt become something fantastic. The whole experience on Mars so far, especially this dock, is hauntingly beautiful. We take the papers from the return explorer, then run back to the city. I stand around for a while and wait for a docking ship just to marvel at the scale of this thing. Now the graphics aren't perfect, and it doesn't even dock at the right place. The rudders clip into the actual walkway and the textures aren't as high quality as they could be, but the idea of having this happen is great. We meet Emil, another explorer, and he tells us to follow his servant, this Martian, so he leads us through the docks, and then the guards just start shooting him for no reason. These are some very trigger-happy guards. Emil leads us to the explorer's camp, and how do you think we get there? Maybe take a ship, or a boat, maybe a light tube? No, we interact with this window. This window to a house in the main dock of the city that then portals us far away to the Explorer Camp. A window of a house. Who designed this? The Explorer Camp is a small bastion in the far lands of Mars, and in a serious scenery change, there is similar style housing when we arrive, but very quickly we're thrown into a shanty town. The houses here are all laid out haphazardly. They're built of bone and wood. The posters of the corners are spines, and the roof canvas seems to be stitched together leather or skin. And as cool as the design is, you can tell they've not actually designed a proper shantytown. They've just put a load of town assets randomly down a hill. Because so many of these houses clip above or below the floor, or into each other, or have spots you can fall down and get stuck in. Bottom of the hill we meet George, then while talking we get ambushed by these one-eyed rock monster things. So add one to the ambush counter, then we kill them and finish talking. George wants us to help sort out some of the poisonous trees around the camp. That means interacting with them, then killing the rock enemy things that spawn, so I go and do that. See, this is what I mean by haphazard placement of assets. They've not custom fit the huts to the mountainside. They've just taken huts designed for flat ground, then staggered them down a cliff. So you can clip under most of them super easy. I mean, look, this tree isn't even on the ground. They've just put this asset in the air. Finish clearing all the trees, then George gives me the info to take back to the main guys. He also says, before I leave, check the small dock platform by the portal and take the stuff from the chest. So I go and do just that. And I find three guys standing on the shore, chatting. And one guy just under the dock, just underwater, standing there. Is he meant to be on the dock? Why does it look like he's been banished? Like, you are cast out of the group, go and stand under the naughty dock. Back in the main area, I get shot at, so I start attacking the guards. But I mean, look at this guy, he's more evasive than Neo. I swing for several minutes and just nothing. Running back through the slums, and there's another crafting station, but this one is blank too. I am convinced that crafting in this game is just offline, because I've collected recipes and I've used them, so I definitely have them, but nothing ever shows up. I take George's info to the cartographer, and while running through the bazaar, this is the worst camera jerking yet. This is a problem, is it with the Unreal Engine? Is the engine the problem here? Is it just what they've chosen to do with the camera in tight spaces? Again, someone who's skilled, please let me know how they would fix this. Because all I would do is have any in-game assets fade out if they are between you and the camera. Hand the info to the cartographer, and then they give me a complete map of Mars. We now just need to take this back to the priest, and the planet will be all nicely mapped out and stuff. Run all the way back, hand the priest the map, finish the quest, and... oh, nothing. Normally the next quest begins where the previous ended. Normally there's an obvious adventure line to follow, but... I guess this was it for the whole map story. I do have those two rubies though, so I should probably go and find the guy from the very start who needed them. I check the world map and I can see a quest to hand in down by the main portal, and yeah, this is him. But once I hand in and he has those, the quest list is now indeed blank. No real direction. Also, it's a strange story beat that the ruby dude wanted me to finish his quest before giving me access to the bazaar, and I've been running through the bazaar for a few hours now. Guess they just forgot about that plot point. Maybe the next quest is in the bazaar, so I travel back and... Oh, yes, the map shows that it is. Ah, it's the same guy that appeared and disappeared earlier and ended the quest line suddenly. Seems like he's a messenger for the royal family and they want to have a word with me. Can't think what about. Maybe it was the ruby heist or the many, many guards I've killed. Next quest needs me to follow this messenger dude through the market and then into the gear house. Quite easy, but on the way we are attacked by a slave and oh good, it's those overpowered grenades again. Well, there is no way I am replaying the game, so I have to find a way to kill this dude. 
Respawn up my corpse, float back to the start, pick up the quest again, and try again, and my second attempt fails because I rush ahead to kill the slave, which works, but I ran too far away from the NPC and lose the trail. So third try, and this goes better. Stick by the dude, kill the slave, and then follow him up the ramps into the house of Aziz. Ah, the paintings. I remember fixing them. Good times. And at the top of the steps, I meet Lord Aziz, the guy in charge. He knows we helped the rebels and stole the rubies, and he's willing to forgive me if I help him out. He says he's got a spy in the rebellion already, and we need to meet the spy, then go eavesdrop on a rebel meeting and bring the info back to him. Why? Why do you need me? Dude, you just said you've got a spy in the rebellion. That's what spies do. Why do you need me to go and do the spy's job? I am giving you no skills you don't already have, but whatever. We are the player, so I guess we have to be important. The spy is pretty well hidden. He's selling rugs in a corner of the gear house with no one else around because that's not suspicious at all. And, right, I hate this. You need to talk to him once to finish the Aziz quest. Then the conversation is cancelled. Then you talk to him again to start his dialogue. Then the conversation cancels. Then again to move the quest on. You need to talk to this NPC three separate times to progress the story. Just have him say all of his dialogue in one interaction. We follow the spy back through the bazaar and he leads us to the rebel base, but he stops to check we are following him so many times. I mean, seriously, I'm going to count how many times he stops or runs backwards. And remember, this isn't a complicated path. It's basically a curved line through the market to the other side. We reach the rebel base. It is literally round the corner from the main house of Aziz. You can probably see it from one of the balconies. And the rebels are having a conversation about weapons and stuff. It's annoying because there are no speech bubbles over NPCs' heads and no names in the chat box, so I don't know who's talking or when one person stops and another person starts. They mention weapons, then they mention the kids they're smuggling are in the same house as the weapons. Ah, right. I mean, everyone likes an underdog, and we've all been conditioned to see the rebels as good guys because of Star Wars, but once you add kidnapping actual children and forcing them into your army to your rebelling checklist, I kind of lose some sympathy for you. Report all this to Aziz, let him know he's got a bad case of the rebels, and Aziz tells us he has a plan, but first he has family problems and we need to go and help his daughter with her stuff. God, I just want to find Orlando, but fine. Head down the steps and what's up, daughter? She's just outside on the balcony and she has an issue with her slaves. They are being unruly and doing awful things like standing around and talking, and this just won't do. So we go and gather them up. Unlike the Barbarian Outpost quest, at least this one has quest arrows pointing to the slaves you need to find. They're doing nothing wrong and they head back to work immediately, which is probably the best result here. Doesn't take long to find them all either. Let the daughter know her five slaves are back and she's still not happy and she wants me now to send a message that standing around and talking will not be tolerated. I am ordered to go to the slave quarters and steal ten slave possessions and bring them to her. Wow, okay, I genuinely do feel like the bad guy now. Mars is messed up. You either join the megalomaniac royals or the child-napping rebels. I miss Dontery. Times were simpler back on the bug planet. Down at the slave quarter and I start rummaging through belongings, boxes and books and stuff. And eventually I gather ten things. But look at the text box. Collecting an item says slave item, then in brackets clothes. And it says this for every item. Were they meant to change the words in the brackets to make it more immersive? Because I've got clothes from every box. Hell, I even got clothes from interacting with the book. What are these slaves wearing? Take the ten items back to the daughter. I essentially picture this as I dump a pile of books, boxes and pots at her feet and she goes, ah yes, the slave clothing. Anyway, she's happy and tells me to go and find her mother in the main building because she also has some tasks that need doing. The mother has hired a new cook, but they're having trouble finding food, so we're sent to the market to find some fresh produce. This just means interact with eight things in the market. I'm not paying for any of this. Do the stall owners even know that I'm working for the royal family? Or are they just happy to let some cyberpunk-looking tanky dude rummage through and take stuff? 
grab the eight things, then go back to the mother, and on my way back I realise how much these decorative pots outside the entrance to the House of Aziz look like carrots. This isn't a game bug, this is just an observation. Whatever the hell my legs are doing though, that is definitely a bug. With the family problems finally sorted, I chat to Lord Aziz and agree to help the main assault against the rebels so I can rescue the kids. We are ordered to go to the docks and basically start a war. This means head back to the temple at the main dock, chat to this dude who summons a portal directly behind us, and then head through the portal to the instanced fight. We arrive at the rebel camp and we talk to the royal forces leader, a Martian called... Tarkren the Spunky. I'm beginning to think whoever named the NPCs had way too much leeway. He explains he's only bothered about confiscating the rebel weapons and we should focus on saving the kids. I mean, sure, that works for me. We storm the rebel base, which means we walk over to this door, then defend from three waves of enemies because the game really has proven there is no better mechanic to a fight than repeating it three times. And then, well, then we meet a mini boss and see a cutscene. We meet Finny, the person apparently responsible for the kidnappings. They explain there are larger forces at work. So we fight them, and of course we win. But then, we get punched in the face by a fat dude. And just before we're killed, Frederick appears, drags us away and throws us through a portal to safety. That is the second time she's done that, I'm beginning to think we owe her. Then the game loads, for a very, very long time. Oh god damn it, not again! You see, something I've discovered while on the Otherland Discord is each world, Lambda Mall, the Water Village, the Chess World, or Mars, is held on a different server. And sometimes, quite often it seems, those servers just go down. So what's happened here is this. Fredericks has saved us by throwing us through this portal which should have taken us back to 8 squared. But at the moment I'm playing, 8 squared is down. So the game can't load us in which means the following strange events now occur. I have to force close the game and reload in. My character is stuck in the instanced fight area, but they're stuck in the small bit behind where the portal would have been during the cutscene. And I cannot seem to leave this small triangular area. There's an invisible wall. I can see a transport portal on the other side of the map, but I can't get to it. You can even see in the chat box to the bottom left, it keeps saying travel failed, destination map not online. My only option is to kill myself and respawn at a portal. This puts me back on Mars, and I don't know where to go. Thankfully, the wiki tells me my next quest is at Monk's Gate, which is a portal on the 8 squared realm. And if I travel back to the Lambda Mall and interact with the main portal, Monk's Gate is indeed now a travel destination. So I try and the screen flashes red. And after it's flashed red, I now can't use the portal to travel anywhere else. If you try to travel to an offline place, not only does it fail, it now locks you out of going anywhere. You basically need to restart the game. So I restart, and I travel to other places to check they are working. And yeah, they are. Bug Planet, Five Isle Water Village, they're all fine. But all of 8 squared is down, so I cannot continue the quest line. But here's the thing. Completing that final quest on Mars, stopping the rebellion, did get me the fourth Steam achievement. And that was the goal. From the first episode, the first hour, this is what we were aiming for. All Steam achievements. Only 3% of players have this. The game maxed out at 200 players, so mathematically, that's only six other people in the world. Surely we're done. Besides, even if I did want to continue this surreal jaunt through space and time, through virtual worlds, even if I was curious to see where it goes to, even if I actually was getting quite invested in finding Orlando and saving Otherland, I can't. Because the next quest needs me to go to 8 squared and the server is offline. No one can go there. So I log off and I explain to the Otherland subreddit that we're finished. Series is over. And I start to write the final script, this one. I even check the Steam charts. Five players. That's a 600% increase. We've done well. And we've had a good run. And then... I get a message on Discord. They reset the 8 squared server. It's back up. Just when I think I'm out, they drag me right back in. So I log back into the Lambda Mall. I try the portal to Monk's Gate and... It works. Now I might have got all the Steam achievements, but I've not finished the game. Far from it. 
And while others may give up here, hell, I was planning to stop here. I want to go as far as I can. So we're pushing forward. Let's accept the next quest. Let's finish Otherland. But oh, the next quest isn't around anywhere. And the map doesn't show a quest marker. So let's just run around, hope to find it. Oh, look at this, this is beautiful. The lens flare in Monk's Gate has writing on it. It says, eight squared till death do us part. I really like this stylistic choice. The whole of eight squared is vastly out of control chess and it's just gorgeous to be in. But here's the problem. The wiki tells me the next quest starts at Fred. So I head to the local village and oh hey, I find Fred. But I can't interact with her. There's nothing. And I can't leave or restart a quest because I'm not currently on a quest. I'm not sure what to do. While thinking, I bump into another player, Mr. Werewolf, another new player and a member of the Discord. We chat for a bit and he's got the quest symbol over Frederick, so it's weird that I haven't. But here's my guess. I finished the final quest on Mars and the cutscene threw me through the portal. What was meant to happen was I was meant to load into another cutscene that takes place here on 8 squared, which continues the storyline. But because it crashed, I have severed that thread. Now, I can travel to Monk's Gate, but the quest doesn't start. And I can't redo the final Mars quest, because doing that would mean heading to the final fight instance, and as I discover when returning to Mars, the temporary portal that sent me there, and the NPC that makes that portal, are both gone. So have I actually managed to break it this time, beyond just turning the graphics down? Has the 8 squared server being down at the exact moment I finished the cutscene on Mars actually severed the thread of prophecy? Am I doomed to continue in this dead world? I can't do that to you again. Of course I fixed this. So join me next week when we pass the monk's trial, visit a Hollywood-style fake town, and visit the digital dumps to watch the world tearing itself apart. Big thank you to my Patreon supporters and Twitch subs who make all of my content possible. The names on screen now are the people funding this. You can support the Patreon from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter, and our Discord channel. And as always, have a great day.